Word of God, let's open up to Matthew chapter 21. As I mentioned, the significance of today is Palm Sunday, better known as the triumphal entry of Christ. And we're going to look at a couple of different things from this passage of Scripture. And um, I want you to know that, that this is, um, let me just put it to you this way. In the four Gospels uh, that were written, there's 89 chapters in, that go- in all four. If you would add them up, there's 89 chapters. One-third of those, just about 30 chapters, are dedicated to the last week of the life of Christ. That's a lot. I don't want to give you all the other stats, but this is such an important day. It's also the, the, the triumphal entry also represents the beginning of the Passion Week. And this is, this is a week that, what, that, that covers a series of a different events that were leading to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which marks the last day of the week of, of the Passion Week. So let's read about this, and I want to talk to you about four groups of people that were attending this event. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 15. The Bible says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king is coming, lowly sitting on a donkey, a colt, a fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. A very great crowd, multitudes spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem and all the, all the city was moved, saying this, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple and he drove out all those who brought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables with money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But you made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the scribes saw the wonderful things he did. And the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. Only the religious get upset, which is what's supposed to take place in a church. Can't be afraid of the move of God in church, whether it's healing or someone getting a demon cast out of them. It's part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. we got to be careful that we never want to sit in the seat of a scoffer when someone's getting free or like, oh, my goodness, look at what they're doing. And I'm going to tell you something right now. You're never going to find that in this church ever. Amen? Hallelujah. I believe someone's going to get free today. I feel like there's a breaker anointing in this house today. By the way, I was, when I was down there, I feel like I need to say this to somebody. Then the enemy's coming at you hard right now. He's coming at you hard. But I want to let you know, it's been broken, and you're going to walk in freedom today. Amen? I don't know who that's for, but it was all over me down there. And I didn't want to get up and say it, but I feel I need to say it now. He's close, but he cannot touch you. You win. Amen? That's the message. All right, as I said a moment ago on this day, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on the week of Passover. And um, it's an interesting holiday. First of all, the, the, the Passover is when they, uh, they ever, okay, so the Jews, if you were Jewish, there were three major holidays you had to go back up into Jerusalem. Anytime you went to Jerusalem, you always went up to Jerusalem. So you had to go to Jerusalem for the Passover, for the Feast of Pentecost, and also the Feast of Tabernacles. So there, 
everybody now is coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover meal and the Passover festival. The streets are packed with people. And as I said a moment ago, the Passover is celebrating, I think I said it, the Passover is celebrating the deliverance of, how, of uh, the, Egypt, uh, the, the Israelites from Egyptian, Egyptian bondage. Amen? So in this, in, this, in this scene, I want you to put in your mind's eye that there were people that they came in from all over the place. All over the country they came in. And like I said a moment ago, there were four different groups of people that were, that were kind of responding and, and people um, following Jesus in. The first group of people that, that, that were there in the, in the group of, of you've got to remember, the streets are not thick, they're not wide. And there's, when, it, when the Bible says there was a multitude, I tried to look that word up and no one could give me like a straight answer of what a multitude is. But I'm telling you, it wasn't like 50 people. It was hundreds, if not thousands of people. So an event like this that, would, that had the pull, if you were Jewish and you had to come into the city, you could assume and you could probably put it together there were thousands of people in the street that day. So here comes Jesus, just as the prophet says, he comes in riding on a donkey, but you know what? There was already a group of people that were following him that day. He didn't just come in with the 12 disciples, because if you read it out of all accounts, it's in every four gospel, but if you read the story in every gospel, you can put together and understand what was actually taking place. So as Jesus is walking in to the gates of um, uh, to the city on this donkey, it was a multitude of people. But let me explain to you who was in that group. Like I said a moment ago, it wasn't just the disciples, but there were people like, like blind Barnabas. Because if you know the story, about a week or two or a week or a few days before this event here, he and his uh, disciples and the multitudes are walking through Jericho. And as they're walking through Jericho, there was a man named blind Bartimaeus that sat at the gate he had to wear a coat to say he got a coat from a government, the government that said it's okay for him to be there and beg for money. So as he's sitting there looking for alms, he hears the commotion because, like I said, there's a multitude of people just in awe of what Jesus does in the lives of people. So when he starts to hear this, he can't see, but he's like, who is it? What's going on? And when he discovered that it was Jesus, he started to scream. He started to yell and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he wouldn't stop. There was a level of desperation. This was his moment. He didn't want to be blind. And you got people in the crowd. They're just they're like, shut up. Stop yelling. And you know what he did? He yelled even louder. Until he got the attention, of, the attention of Jesus. And when he did, Jesus looks at him. He says, bring him to me. He says, what can I do for you? And he says, I want to see. And he says, by your faith, you've been healed. You know what he did? It is praiseworthy. He dropped that coat because that coat gave him his identity as a blind beggar. But he dropped that coat and he walked with Jesus. Because if you look at verse 52, it says he went and he followed Jesus. Where was Jesus going? To this event right here. He's one of them. Amen. There was a multitude that had been touched and blessed by the ministry of Jesus. It wasn't just blind Bartimaeus. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm convinced that Mary, the, the, the woman who, who anointed the, the feet of Jesus when she poured the expensive perfume and it got the attention of Judas because he's like, I cannot believe she's wasting that kind of money on him. It was a beautiful act of worship. She was there. You know who else was there? Martha was there. Because he spent most of his time there. If you read in one of the Gospels, it escapes me now. But, but when he had that day, he would always go back to the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Let me tell you, Lazarus was in that group because you know what? He was alive. This is a man who died, and Jesus even waited for four days to go back. you got to remember the story when she, the, the women, Mary and Martha, send a, send a message. Go get him. Go get him. Get him here because there's only three days. If he's dead after the third day, the it's impossible for the spirit to come back into him. It was a Jewish myth. So what does Jesus do? 
If he does what the father tells him to do, he stays right where he is and starts doing the business in a different town. When he finally made it to the place, the first one to run out there is guess who? Martha. And she just let him have it. What are you doing? I called for you three days ago, two days ago. You know what? If you came when I asked you to come, my brother would be alive right now. And Jesus gives her a truth. He basically says, look, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And I didn't say that. That was a different scripture. Sorry about that. I should probably know that. But she says, he says, he says, I know he's going to come to life again. And she's thinking at the resurrection. But he's trying to tell her, no, 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 you don't understand. Yes, at the resurrection, when we call you home, you're going to be there. But I'm, the, I'm life now. Where is he? He's in a tomb, but it stinks. It's four days. Jesus goes to the tomb in front of everybody. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Back to life. Lazarus, come out. Let me tell you something. It wasn't just the three of them that were there that day at the triumphal entry. It was all the people that saw that guy come out of the tomb in a fine condition after they unwrapped him of his grave clothes. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen. I firmly believe the woman with the issue of blood that was healed, she was at this triumphal entry. Jesus just was doing what he did, changing the lives of people, touching everybody who needed anything. I want you to know something. Anybody that came to Jesus was never denied a healing. Amen. Hallelujah. I firmly believe, I firmly believe that Jerry is the temple ruler was in that crowd that day. He had something to cheer about. Because when Jesus was meeting the woman with the issue of blood, it was on the same. He was already going to the house of Jairus. He already got news that the girl had already died. So she touched the hem of the garment. She's healed. He's like, all right, let's continue on. Go to the Jairus' Jairus's house. He was a temple ruler, by the way. So he was like a Pharisee. Come in. I know who you are. I'll have you in my house. And, and Jesus looks at them and he goes, listen. He goes, she's not dead. And you know what? The people in the room, they mocked him. The Bible says they mocked him to scorn. She's dead. He calls her back to life. They got something to praise. Amen. They were in the crowd that day. I fully believe. I'll give you one more here. I'm convinced the man that laid at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years with no life in his legs, waiting for the water to stir and hope to be getting in before someone else does. Jesus walks up to him and he says, pick up your mat and walk. The Bible says, immediately the power of God came into his legs and he stood up and he began to walk and follow him amen he's good this morning isn't he let me tell you what this is a group of people that were following Jesus on his triumphal entry and they were yelling Hosanna let me tell you what Hosanna means it depends on what's taking place because this group of people were singing Hosanna as a praise and adoration, just like we sang earlier. We were praising the living God for what he did. That's what you sing when you're praising him, amen? There's another term, another definition of Hosanna, which we'll share in a moment. The second group of people that day that were in the streets celebrating the Feast of Passover was that what they came in. So we, had, so we had the disciples. Now we got all those people I mentioned from the beginning that, that they live beyond the points of Jerusalem. Like I said, if you were somewhere in, um, in, in the nation of Israel, you had to make a pilgrimage into, into the street and into Jerusalem. But lots of the people that came in were there for only a religious obligation. There was a lot of people. You know what? They came in because you know what? It's what they did their entire lives. You know what? They came in. They did the same thing. They took the same route to Jerusalem. Every year they stayed at the same place. Every year they performed the same rituals, the same sacrifice, recited the same prayers. You know what? It was religion. I have to go because I'm a Jew. I need to go in. Disconnected. 
You know, years ago, I used to work in New York City. Uh, before I went to Bible College, a couple of years before I went to Bible College, I worked for a company um, in the jewelry district, dis- district, and I was a salesman for them. And the people that I worked for, for were, um, they were, they were um, very strict, conservative Jewish people that, that really followed the code of the law. So it was interesting because I was, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not Jewish, so here's for example. So Monday was my day to go into the office, and it was lunchtime. So my, my boss would come up when I started working there, and he'd say, listen, if you've got to go to the bathroom, go now, because we're going to be in the, uh, the hallway praying from 12 to 1 o'clock. So since you're not Jewish, you can't come in there, and neither can the women. And I said, all right, they're following the law. So they're out there, and I'm looking at the camera, and they're just doing their deal. They're like going in. But you weren't allowed to do that. But what I want to show you is this, that, you know, there was a time when, I, when, when we had to travel with them. And one of the places that we went to was we had to do this show, this jewelry show in Las Vegas every single year. And um, when we went in there, I went in with the family. I was in one, of, one of a couple different salesmen. And uh, I had to, uh, you know, share a room with one of the owners. So one morning, he was, uh, he was up very, very early. I mean, the show started at like 9.30, 10. I mean, he was flipping the lights on at like 5.30 or 6. There was no alarm. He was the alarm. So the lights are going on. I'm like, man, it's bright in here. So I just like sat up in my bed. I grabbed my Bible, and I'm like reading like Galatians. So he goes over to the table. He has a box, and he opens the thing up, and he, he unscrolls this um, this. It was like a really nice leather kind of scroll. But in that leather scroll was was a prayer shawl. He had the Torah. And he had a couple different boxes with um, with leather straps around them. So he sits down at the table and he puts on his yarmulke. And then he puts on this this box on his forehead. And it's called a um, it's called a head to fill a. Also called a phylactery. Linz, if you got that picture, you could put it up. But what this did was he had one up on his head, and he also had an arm to fill her, which is a little box. There it is. Um, you see the thing sticking out of his head? That's, that's the box I'm talking about right there, but it was attached. So here's the thing. That, that, those boxes had the scripture. It had the Torah and the prayers that he was required to pray. So if you notice, the arm to fill her there, he has it. It's actually, you don't see it, but the box is up underneath his shirt there. So he would put the box on the non-dominant arm close to the heart because the idea was this. You need to have the Word of God, the Torah, in your mind and in your heart. So it was a visible representation when he began to pray. Amen? So as he begins to pray, by the way, he starts, he starts praying however he prayed. It's in Hebrew, and that's when he began to pray. It's a, it's a word called davling. It was a type of prayer that he did. But in the middle of his davel, as he's praying, he started to rock back and forth like this. And in the rocking, that's called the shockling. So he's, this is how he prayed. So me not really knowing anything, I'm, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to say anything when he started to do his deal. So I just said, hey, what are you doing? And he's like... He, I, 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 he barked at me. He's like, you, you cannot talk to me right now. And I'm like, I'll go back to Galatians. So I put the Bible back up, and I just watched him. But I want, you to, I want you to know something. After about 20 or 25 minutes, he packed everything up, and I, I, I learned I didn't speak again, but I put my hand up. I have a question. And he says, he goes, he, you know, he said, what? So I said, let me ask you a question. What are you doing? Like, what, what, like what, what are you praying? Like, what's, what's the prayer? And here I am. Like, in a year or two, I'm going to Bible college, so I was really interested in what he was doing. And he says to me, he goes, I don't know. It's in Hebrew. And I said, I said so he goes, yeah, I, learned it. I, I had to memorize it as a kid. Now, listen to me. I'm not saying everyone across the board is like this. This is my experience with him, but it taught me something. And after that, I, I said, I said, listen, so you're reciting a prayer. You don't know what it means. And he said, exactly. And he said, maybe when you go to Baba College and learn Hebrew, you could tell me what it means. And I got to be honest with you. In that moment, my heart just sank a little bit because it's, it's like I hear in my spirit. I'm like, you know, I hear their many words, but their hearts are far from me. And it kind of broke my heart a little bit because he was such an he's, they're amazing people, and I love them dearly. But you know what it made me think? 
I started to think, and I said, you know what? We have to be careful. Because, you know what? We could begin in relationship and end up in religion and be disconnected. It's not relegated to, to my friend. It's relegated to faith in general. You got to guard that. And let me tell you something. The only way, and I've learned the only way, the greatest insulator of not allowing that to happen is the motivation of the heart and the deep desire to, to meet with the living God on a daily basis. I'm telling you, when you give him and you surrender your life and you're like, Father, I want to meet with you, trust me, it's about the heart and he will meet you. I promise you he will. He's just dying to meet with people. Amen? I want you to know, 2,000 years ago, if you and I were to go into Jerusalem and want to go into the temple, I want to tell you that, that we couldn't, that there were places. In other words, let me just put it to you this way. If you were a Jewish woman, you could go into the temple so far. If you were a Jewish man, you can go even farther. If you were a priest, you could go in the farthest. But if you were a Gentile, you would be confined to a place called the Court of the Gentiles. That was back then. And it made me think how differently things are with Jesus who is so willing to include all people. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you a rest. I said a moment ago that the religious system works very well today in many different denominations. So let me just give you a little bit of a difference between a, a religion, the religious process, and a relationship. Religion emphasizes the outward appearance while Jesus emphasizes an inward condition of the heart. Why are you thinking evil in your heart? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Religion is an outward expression that robs you of an inward transformation because transformation only happens through Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him. Those who abide, he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, man, the fruit is going to reflect what you abide in. I'm not down fully on religion, but the reality is this. There is good religion. In James 1.27, the Bible says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to care for the orphan and the widow in distress, and to keep yourself from being polluted by the world. Back in the story here, the second group of people that came in from a distance, they were actually excited to be at that festival. They knew exactly what it was for. They were excited to be in the festivities. It was a festive environment. But they had a little bit of a different understanding of why they were coming in. The Bible says in John chapter 12, 12 through 15, the next day the great multitude had come into the feast, and when they heard that Jesus was uh, Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of palm trees and went down to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Verse 14 says, Then Jesus, when he had found a donkey, he sat on it, and it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Again, Jesus is coming into the city, letting everybody know that he's the Messiah and the King of Israel in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. So this group of people in the street, they're not the religious kind of like there because they got to be there. They want to be there, but their idea of why they're there is completely different. You see, this group of people, they're yelling Hosanna, but the word Hosanna because they're looking for something different. You know what? They were hoping that Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Israel, was going to come in and lay down and lay out the Roman government. That's what, he was, that's what they were hoping for. They were hoping that Jesus, the King, was going to come and start a revolt against Rome. So they did what the other group did. You know what? They laid down palms right in front of them. By the way, a palm is representative of peace and victory. They laid their coats down because you always laid your coat down in the presence of a king. And they're like, our guy's right here. But you want to know something? They missed it. They absolutely missed it. You see, when a king was going to go into a town, what they rode was going to say what was going to take place. 
You see, if a king rode in on a, on a stallion or some sort of horse that was bred for warfare, the leadership of that city they were riding into was going to know something's going down and it has to do with us and it's probably not going to go well. They knew a war was going to start. But if a king rode into a neighboring country or town riding on a donkey, that, completed, that, that said something completely different. A donkey is not bred for warfare. But what it said to them, I come in peace. You see, he's not riding a horse. He's riding a donkey. But they wanted it. You see, their Hosanna, this definition in this context, means save us now. Save us. They're tired of living under the thumb of the Roman government. And that's our guy. You know why they wanted uh, Jesus to do this? Because Jesus, the Messiah, is in the lineage of David. In other words, Jesus is in the lineage of David. What do we know about David? He was a man of warfare and bloodshed. If he's in the lineage, well, we got the right guy. See, they were expecting that Jesus to do what David did several times when he was alive. He took down governments hard. Not what they expected. I want you to know this morning, the will of God for Jesus was not to set up a new political system. That's what they wanted. You see, the will of God was that no man should perish and everyone would come to repentance. The will of God was to save mankind from their sins through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus it's interesting because in John 18, 36, Jesus says, you know what? My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, guess what? My servants would fight and prevent my arrest of the Jews. And I'll tell you what. He said, my kingdom's not in this realm. So there was great disappointment among the people because every one of them that were screaming, hail, hail, King Jesus, Celebrating him, save us, are now yelling, crucify him, crucify him. It was only a few days later. You've got to realize it's only like a seven-day thing. I want you to know there, here's my question for you. Well, let me set it up this way. They had it in their heart. And they had it in their mindset of what they wanted God to do. They wanted the Messiah to do something. And he didn't do it. Can I just tell you, this is like, this is like life right here. This is like real right here. Because how many times, I'm going to tell you right now, your will is going to confront the will of God almost on a daily basis. They were singing him praises contingent upon him taking down Rome. I'm only praising him if he does what I want. You see, if I can help you with this. We like what we like. We know what we like. You know what people do? And I used to do it. I know what I want. And you know what? It's not sinful. It's not bad. It's actually pretty good. So you know what? I would pray for about 45 seconds. I feel good. I'm like, you know what? God's on board with this one. So basically, I'm telling God what my will is, and he's going to be all right with it. That's what we do, right? Could we be honest here? Amen. Let me tell you, that's a recipe for a disaster. You will end up in places you wish you never were. Let me help you with something here. And I've learned this the hard way. His will is better than our will. I promise you it is. Amen. I want you to know the human will of Jesus was challenged in the Garden of Gethsemane. Are you aware of that? The Bible says in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus went a little farther. He fell to his face on the ground and prayed, Father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken from me. 
yet not as I will, but as you will. So let me tell you, Gethsemane was all about a choice between human will and choosing the will of the Father Father, during temptation. Let me tell you, Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew he was going to be walking the path of pain. Jesus knew he was taking the sin of mankind on his back. And Jesus knew he was going to be separated by, from his father. Father, if there's any other way, I'm on board. But not my will, your will. I want you to realize something here. In the Garden of Gethsemane, if the human will of Jesus was done, it would have spared Jesus' life. But the will of the Father was to spare humanity from eternal pain and give a promise of everlasting life. I love this scripture where it says, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Can you guess who the joy is? That's us. You're the joy. When it comes to where our will, we have to remember his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And they're always better. So how do we walk in God's will? This is like an angel question. I figured it out. Through a life of surrender. There's no other way. You can read a million books on this, but I'm telling you, that's it right there. Father, here I am. I lay down my life. The, you know, the humility has been kind of the theme a little bit through the, most of the messages I've spoken in the last month. But surrender is one of the most powerful things you can do because it opens you up to everything of who he is. He's not going to fight with your will. He'll let you have your will. But the minute you say, I yield, I'm yours. You know what? A surrendered life is marked by one of great clarity. It's one of direction. It's one of peace. It's one of rest. It's one of joy. It's one of fulfillment. It's one of freedom. And not momentary freedom. It's a place of trust, and it's a place of great faith. And all it takes is me saying, or you saying, I'm yours. I surrender. Great. Now, let me give you and fulfill you and lead you exactly the way I want to lead you. It's going to be great. Amen? You're fighting with yourself, and you're going to lose. Hallelujah. Last group of people in the temple that day, or the triumphal entry, were the Pharisees who were indignant because the people ran to Jesus. In John chapter 12, verse 19, I think Zoe read it. The Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And you know what? They've been trying to end the life of Jesus for the last three and a half years. But they were never able to do it. There was a point in the Garden of Gethsemane when he's like, you know, they're about to take him. They're going to arrest him. He's like, look, he, look I could call down um, 12 legions of angels. A legion was 6,000. 12 sixes is 72, if I'm not mistaken, right? Okay. He could have called down 12,000, 72. What's the math on that? Help me, somebody. I already lost it. I can't think. I'm looking at you, and I'm not thinking straight. Whatever the math is on that, okay, that's what he could have called in to help him out, okay? A lot of people, a lot of angels. It happens. I start looking at someone. I focus on someone. I completely lose my train of thought. It's terrible. But I want you to know something. I say that because, you know what? No one had to take his life. He gave it. He laid his life down. Amen? And I'm grateful he did. Because had he not done it, we're done. Hallelujah. Pastor Chad, would you come up? I'm going to have you play. Hallelujah. 
I don't know what group of people you might find yourself in alignment with today. You know what, maybe you're like the group of people in the very beginning who have a strong relationship with the Lord. You've been experienced, you, you have experienced the power and the presence of God. And you're like, man, I love my relationship with my Father. I want you to know that if you come down to these altars and find a place right over there, and you say, Father, fill me more. I promise you, he'll fill you more. Amen. Maybe you like the second group of people where, you know what, you started out like really great in a relationship with the Father, but it slid into this religious practice and you feel disconnected. Here's the thing, a movement of faith right down to the altar to find with him and say, Father, here I am. I give myself to you. And you're going to have a loving Father receive you and say, I've been waiting for you. Maybe you like the third group of people who is constantly battling between your will and his will. Today's the day of a shift in your life. But it's going to happen when you come down and say, Father, here I am. I just surrender. The presence of God's going to move on you. He's going to touch your life and he's going to lead you. Hallelujah. If you need a healing, if I could have a prayer minister come on up, Pastor Moline. Some of the other ones. Hallelujah. If you need a healing in your body today, come now and don't wait. The Holy Spirit is going to heal you. That's it. Amen. Over the course of this message, it's just, um, I just hear um, anxiety. So if you're that person that's dealing with anxiety or a level of um, just this, it's like, the only way I could frame it up this way is this, this, this has been a week of complete discord. And it's like you're just getting hit, and you're getting hit, and you're getting hit. And you just feel anxious. I want you to let you know that's a spirit. And if you come down, it's going to go in an instant. You see, a foul thing cannot stand in the presence of God. When you exercise your authority, the devil has to go. Amen? If that's for you, I want you to come down. Hallelujah. And lastly, I want to make an offer to you. I want to speak to the person that, that is far from God. They started out in a relationship with God, and now they're, they're far from him. In other words, if for whatever reason, they walked away from God. If that's you, I want you to come down. He's expecting you to come home, and you're going to, again, be met with a loving Father. If that's you, come. Hallelujah. I want to invite you to stay and sit and just dwell in the presence of God. But if you would feel a release, feel free. 
and we'll see you next Sunday. Listen, bring somebody out. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, we give you glory today. Father, we thank you for the power of your word. Father, we thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Father, I pray for each and every one today, Father, as they sat in your presence, Father, that the seed that went in, Father, will go into ground that was ready to receive it and it will produce 160 and 30 fold in the lives of each and every one. Father, I ask you to pour your blessing and your favor over each and every one this morning. As they go this week, oh God. I ask you, Father, that you would just protect them as they go. And Father, I just thank you. Thank you for meeting with us today. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. Feel free to just sit in his presence.